In the desolate wasteland known as South Dakota exists the horrifying reality that not only is the nearest person to you more than 98.7 miles on average away, meaning that if you want to hang out with anyone, you'd have to drive for over an hour away, but the second reality is, is that there is a monster only 0.3 miles away from you at any given time in this state. My cousin unironically likes places like this where you can watch your dog run away for three weeks and after Seeing this area firsthand? Uh, it's horrifying. <laughs> South Dakota slander aside, in the events of the burrowers, we see my statement above is correct. A small family would be attacked by something unseen in the night and dragged off to a nightmarish end in the darkness. Upon their small farm being discovered by a few other men, a posse would be rounded up in what they had assumed was just a hostile tribe in the area. As this group set out, it would become rapidly apparent though based on context clues of abandoned wagons, destroyed Native American settlements, and belongings left behind that something was stalking the area. But the group couldn't figure out what exactly it was. Eventually, however, they would come face to face with the problem and realize they were woefully ill-equipped to deal with it. Containing a poison, or venom really, that would completely immobilize a human against their will, this would give these creatures time to snack on a person whenever they desired. Even a cut would release this venom more slowly, but once it was there, eventually everything would go numb as the neuromuscular junctions would be overwhelmed by this toxin. But what are these creatures in the burrowers, and how does this toxin work on a neurological level? Let's discuss that in today's episode. We kick off our story today with this being a Lionsgate film, uh, and like with most Lionsgate's film on this friggin' channel, I am completely screwed, so get your views in while they aren't copyright hit. A woman named Marianne is hanging out with another man named Coffee. He's seemingly going to ask her to marry him, but he's having issues getting it out. He hands her a token, also known as a brooch, as she runs back and kisses him. We are in the Dakota territories in 1879, and much like the Dakotas in 2023, not much has changed. Just drove there at like 3 a.m. a few weeks back, actually. I didn't see a car on I-90 for over 45 minutes. It's a major highway. That was a weird experience. Stay strapped or get clapped in the dead of night. As a family is in for the night themselves, they're pulling a splinter out of Youngling's finger, but it's probably too late and he's gonna go septic. Good luck, little bro. As they work at it, a man outside begins firing his force multiplier as the dad gets ready to lock and load Brides of Christ because back then, that could mean a multitude of things. Of course, if your neighbor is firing into the night in current times, that could also mean a multitude of things. More likely that World War III has finally kicked off and the Russians have finally invaded. It has been a red dawn. A woman yells out as a man bursts in, telling the women to go to the Selter and bring the younglings there. The men are going to go out and fight. As they huddle down there, they can hear the men above them screaming and then something walking above scraping. It then stops and begins breaking through the floorboards as a lantern falls, igniting the place as screams are heard, as well as like sloshing blows according to the subtitles. What is a sloshing blow? You be the judge of that. So then we get our title, The Burrowers. The next day, a man arrives to find the small outpost has been overwhelmed. His name is Fergus, colloquially known as Turd Ferguson, and also known as Coffee, which he came to find Marianne as he keeps the family's picture. He also cuts his finger, so, I mean, he's gonna go into septic shock in about two weeks. The older man, John Clay, was strangely out there as he says Native Americans took them. And he bases his opinion on absolutely nothing. Well, not nothing, I suppose, as things were a little dicey back then. And also, he calls them Indians, but they're not from India. So, like, Native Americans. But anyhow, a different group is in a different area as they walk towards a tree line as the man brags about putting three men up in that tree. I mean, that's just your casual picnic conversation, I suppose. But at least, you know, it's the Old West, so that maybe that is true. I don't know. Also, they chose an area in the sun rather than, like, the shade, which was two feet back. Absolutely bold strategy could not be me. A man then comes riding up as the wish version of Nathan Fillion tells the family to go inside as this man ain't Sunday riding. He gets his force multiplier ready, but Coffee gives William the note from Clay. They are essentially rounding up a posse to get everyone from the outpost back, or who's ever left alive. As they check said outpost, William finds a cut on the neck of the people. Coffee walks off and finds a weird hole in the ground as well. Checking the hole, they realize nothing is there, or at least, well, not completely on the surface, which, uh, foreshadowing. Henry shows up with his outfit as the group then digs the graves of the bodies that were left behind before setting out for the six that were still missing. Coffee, assuming Marianne is still in the land of the living, wants to go find her as soon as possible. Clay is upset at where they're headed, which is a reservation, remarking they aren't going to find kidnapped people on a reservation. He suggests that they move off on their own, as William says they don't know what they are looking for or how to find them, so we need to stick together for now. As they walk, the horse then steps into a hole in the ground, causing it to freak out. As it pans over the hole, however, it's clear this was a sternum, and it just cracked through as whoever's down there breathes their last breath. Which, alright, so like a sternum would absolutely break from the weight of a horse, but it wouldn't like peel back the skin to this amount. 
and exposed that much. It's very interesting because someone in that state would not be breathing their last breath from a hit like that. They, they would have already been done, but that seems like way more than just a horse hoof. So as they move past it, assuming it'd just be a prairie dog hole, which nobody checks, in the distance, Henry spots a horse and a Native American. Rather than just go talk to the guy, he ends up taking out the horse as they go after him. He's on foot though, and they're on horses, so that's not good. So eventually he just kind of gets knocked out. As the negotiations now begin, if you can call them that, William begins talking to him, basically asking if he knows who took the family at the outpost, assuming he's a part of that tribe. Henry says that they have to do this in order to go in the right direction rather than just flying blind. Later, though, they haven't learned anything, so the not-ideal techniques begin as they try to get him to talk. They begin to eventually realize they aren't even asking the guy questions anymore, so they're just torturing him at this point. So, uh... Yeah, Henry may be some damaged goods, as you may have come to realize. Callahan then walks over to feed the Native American and says, You'll be awake in your grave and alive when they feed. Of course, Callahan doesn't speak the language, so that goes completely unnoticed. And as they raise a toast, Henry starts freaking out about who fed the Native American. He kicks the food out of his hand, beta move. And actually, Henry the actor is usually the guy that is unstable and does like this questionable thing that makes the rest of the squad mad. I think he was actually also in like Shaving Ryan's Privates or something. Wait, hell, hold on. That may have been a different movie. Anyhow, he begins yelling at Walnut as Coffee stands up and says he fed him. Clay basically shows that he would raise a revolver on Henry if he attacked Coffee, as William then calms everyone down saying, the food was terrible anyways and nobody is better for it. Henry then backs off at this point as Coffee apologizes and they put three men up on guard as the rest of the group hits the hay. As they sleep, however, something is moving in the soil in the distance. As the grass rustles Velociraptor style, which in my script I actually misspelled Velociraptor and the spelling suggestion that came up was Velocipede, which is more disturbing. Horrific revelations aside, it moves towards them, towards the passed out guards. The other soldier then goes to the passed out one and finds he's just completely drunk and snoring. As a soldier reaches for the bottle, he sees something, but Samuel won't wake up. He's then attacked from behind and knocked out. The next morning, they find Henry lost some of his boys last night, which he's not happy about. They question the Native American again, as he remarks, the burrowers seem to like white men too. They are confused as the translation as to what he's saying, because the translator isn't too familiar with the dialect. So what he reports back isn't actually what the man is saying. Clay now loses it over hearing this guy scream for like 30 minutes straight as he kicks the other guy, which then sets off Henry. Clay says that he's heard enough of this man screaming, and yeah, I mean, the guy is like offering no info at this point. This entire interaction was probably not warranted. But checking the ground outside the camp, they spot several of the swirls in the grass and dirt. It's around this point that uh, it might be important to bring up what you saw at the outpost as well, but nobody seemingly does. Like, you saw this exact thing, which means whatever happened there is near you as well. And with three men having gone missing, it might be worth it to, you know, mention. So the four men now agree to leave their military escort. Stopping for the night, Coffee goes to rip one as something moves through the grass. One guard for every two hours is set up as Coffee returns back to camp, but as he does, Clay raises his rifle as Walnut joins up with the quad squad making it the Quint stint. That was really lame. Also, they welcome him as the fifth men as they continue the search. Riding the next morning, they continue to find these swirls everywhere along with like abandoned wagons. All the valuables were left behind on the wagon, making this seem like it was not a robbery, but something else. Coffee then throws a rock at a tree at this point out of boredom as they all take turns trying to hit said tree. Things were pretty boring in South Dakota, still are. As Dobby goes down, and yes, his name is literally Dobby, to find a rock, he finds some hair and as he pulls it, it was clearly attached to somebody's skull. They pull back some dirt and realize the person is still down there. They pull her out of the dirt and find horrifically she's still breathing. She has a cut on her neck that has been sealed with some sort of material. They take off her shoe when they hear that she is moving her foot, but the rest of her body is completely immobile. She's alive, but basically locked in, which is a fate that is legitimately worse than death. So what is being locked in or locked in syndrome? Locked in is one of my biggest fears next to like rabies or prions. If you have watched this channel long enough, you know, I went into microbiology as a scientist because A, I find it interesting. And two, I consider it a know your enemy type of thing. Your body is also the enemy because it's made out of meat. And uh, the things that attack your meat suit are also your enemy. Everything is your enemy. Anyhow, locked in syndrome is typically going to be like a stroke within the brainstem. I remember watching a story about a guy who had a headache. He went to sleep and had a stroke in a part of his brainstem. And when he like awoke, his heart and lungs were still functional, but the blood clot had hit at just the right area for voluntary muscular control. Because of this, for the rest of his life, still to this day, he's been unable to move. We can assume, based on what we were seeing with this woman, 
who was under the ground, that she is essentially locked in, but it's more than that. Locked in on specifically with the brainstem would not affect her eyes ability to close or her ability to speak or look around or anything like that with facial movement, basically because where the brain sits with those nerves, it's able to control it and doesn't have to go through the brainstem. But given that cut has affected the neck and with it stopped her entirely from moving except for like her toe, this would have been a bloodborne neurotoxin that does not affect the autonomic functions such as breathing and your heartbeat, but strangely affects the autonomic functions concerning blinking. All voluntary musculature contractions appear to have been largely affected, but how is this possible? I believe this is a catalyst, or there must be a catalyst that speeds up the neurotoxin, which we'll see here shortly, which will give us more clues as to how this works. So William takes the crucifix from the girl and gives it to Coffee, as everyone is pretty rattled at this point. They tie a horse to the wagon as they send the girl and Dobby back to the fort. Which, I mean, don't get me wrong, best intentions and all that, but why would you not be more smart about this and send another person with him? Like, you know, something out there is snacking and hiding bodies. Perhaps the buddy system would be uh, better in this instance? But then again, I'm not a cowboy from 1879 dealing with monsters, so what do I know? They then cover her eyes as she can't close them on her own, which is a very real thing. There is a jellyfish off the coast of Australia, which of course it would be off the coast of Australia, known as the, and I'm going to try to say this correctly, Urukanji jellies. Probably did not say that correctly, but it's a box jellyfish. These specific jellyfish possess a neurotoxin that attacks the nervous system directly, which has the unfortunate side effect of shutting down the heart and lungs of a person as well. When swimming, they will come into contact unknowingly with these tentacles. The nematocyst will then inject an extremely potent and rapidly acting venom. Envenoming can involve severe localized and systemic effects, including cutaneous pain, inflammation, necrosis, hypertension, followed by hypotension, which means very low blood pressure, cardio vascular collapse and cardiac arrest which results in your end. What tends to happen to people is if they are stung in the water they will remain out there as the toxin takes hold and they will find that they aren't able to swim back to shore in time as they go under while they are still very much so alive. Eventually, they will drown as they are unable to swim back to the surface and get air. What's worse than this is the toxin will actually clear the system in a few hours. One man found himself stung and hightailed it back to the beach where he would collapse. Laying there, people didn't know if he was sleeping or really what was going on, so they just kind of left him alone until finally someone called over a lifeguard where they rolled him over and found that he was barely breathing due to this toxin affecting the intercostal muscles as well as the diaphragm. They were able to keep him breathing through things like CPR, and when his heart became extremely weak, they began compressions on him, keeping his brain perfused. Fortunately for the man, they were able to keep him alive until the venom cleared his system and his body had function return. But in a horrific twist of fate, however, while they had him on his back and they were performing CPR, he could not shut his eyes as the sun was directly overhead, and this resulted in him going blind due to the damage to his retinas from the sun's rays. Basically, this venom is incredibly nasty, and you should always remember to cover the eyes of a person who is staring straight up in a paralyzed position. So as the Quad Squad continues on after losing Dobby, they pass by burnt out Native American settlements that were abandoned and then finally hit the tree line. As they ride through, they listen to how quiet it is, which indicates somebody's nearby. They then spot a man in the distance as a whistle is let out, and now they know they're pretty much surrounded. Coffee then fires a shot at one of the men, making the locals hostile to them. That's why you just don't randomly fire a shot off at somebody. Back over with Dobby, he grabs the girl and stops off for the night. He remarks how pretty she is, oh god, he knows she's pretty now, and then he kisses her like a total weirdo as she begins scratching, and he realizes that she's awake. Yeah, bro, the whole time, actually. <laughs> Back over at Forest Adventure, they keep riding as Clay then takes point and then takes around to the neck as he's out in front as the Native Americans from earlier are hostile towards them because of what they did earlier. A horse then falls on Walnut's leg after catching a round through the skull as Clay meets his end and the three now hide behind Walnut's horse's carcass. While they go completely to take Clay out by smashing his face, ouchies, they then take out that guy who did that attack. Meanwhile, back over at Young Lover's Pasture, the creatures that knocked the girl out now knock out Dobby. They slice his neck, allowing for the poison to drop in and immobilize him. He is then forced to watch one then eat the girl as she's ready now, as he's dragged off to a grisly fate. He's rolled in a hole and then covered up with dirt with his eye still exposed. He could just barely move his finger, but that's it on that front. So with this attack, we begin to see there are two processes based on what we will also see later. The neck is sliced, and this is the initial envenomation. The claw they possess appears to be where the venom comes out of, which in turn allows for the body to be immobilized. The person who is attacked also has this liquid dropped into their neck, which I believe does two things. First, it appears the fluid is sort of helping the venom spread more quickly throughout the body, utilizing the circulatory system. 
This liquid likely combines with the venom, making it less viscous, which is the reason why I believe it's fairly viscous to begin with, and then moves into the jugular or carotid artery. There is clearly a secondary function as well. The cut is very precise, however, as we can see there is no blood coming out of the neck. It also appears to seal the wound, or maybe it wasn't deep enough, as this would probably prevent a bleed out. And this species that is hunting humans is said to be a bloodsucker as well as an organ eater. They bury you and wait for you to basically start decomposing as everything becomes softer as they begin to suck out the liquefied goop that used to be your intestines. And this means it may not just be decomposition, but it's acting like a spider venom as well, breaking down structures in the body, causing them to liquefy while the prey is still alive. The venom appears to serve this purpose as well as a wound sealer so that the prey does not bleed out. If the prey bleeds out from like a neck cut, then this would prevent the venom from entering the circulatory system properly to destroy the organs as well. But it also would leave very little blood for the creature to enjoy. While this fluid appears to have enzymatic properties speeding up the venom and sealing the wound, again, it should be noted that the initial cut in the neck is when the venom is injected. Just the venom, although slower moving, appears to have the issue of actually moving through the body with the speed required to put down the victim quickly or at least paralyze them. It will ultimately begin to have systematic effects on the body the longer the person is moving, however. Which we will see here momentarily when we talk about how the venom affects the nervous system and the neuromuscular junctions. Back over at the trio, they are waiting on another ambush. They decide to form a plan, light a ton of poison oak, and burn everyone's lungs who gets close, and then double tap the other guy. Yes, if you didn't know, much like getting poison oak on your skin, which causes welts for most people, and for those who don't have that, lucky you, breathing the sap oil causes a massive allergic reaction that causes lung irritation and lung swelling. It can actually also lead to you bleeding inside of your lungs, which causes blood to fill up your lungs, and from there, leads you to suffocate. So if you're burning poison oak, don't breathe in the smoke. Getting out of the forest, they then try to figure out if they should head back or keep searching. William sleeps on his horse as they set off towards camp for the night, and then as they arrive, they discuss the loss of Clay, as William says he will take first watch. Coffee is then awoken by a rustling noise all around them. Walnut comes back as the fire is really high up. They think William did it to alert the Native Americans to their presence while he makes a break for it. But they figure out pretty quickly that it's actually something much different and the fire was raised that high to help them. They hear a yell and start randomly firing into the darkness, guaranteed to not hit the guy that you're trying to save. Don't worry about it. They're able to drive off the attacks as William realizes his neck has been cut and he cannot feel his hand, but he can still move it. Which is very interesting, actually. So the question is why? As you may have guessed, the venom, as mentioned, is located and injected from a presumed claw that the creature has. The spit that drips out of their mouth contains the enzyme that helps speed up the venom, but with this not accomplished, the venom still has the ability to slow the prey down. The first symptom of the venom appears to be disruption of the sensory neurons in the body. While the motor neurons remain functional, the sense of feeling in this area is the first to go, with later problems worsening. It is not unheard of for prey to be bitten by like a snake or a Komodo dragon and then that creature using its sense of smell also to track down the prey. For these creatures, if a bite or at least the cut happens with their claw, it would seemingly mark that person with a scent trail that the creature can then subsequently follow. The open wound accompanied by the injection of venom would very likely produce this trail, which is then only sealed by the saliva of these creatures. However, I do believe they would still be able to smell them. So the reasoning behind this is, is when they bury their prey across vast distances, they would be able to return when the person is ready to be consumed so that they don't lose their prey. This means the scent would have to be rather strong in order for the creature to find their buried prey inside of the dirt. However, with only half of the process done, this means that any prey that has been injected can not only be found according to the scent they produce, but the venom will ultimately result in the prey having difficulty moving and operating their body, indicating the venom is still moving throughout, just at a lower rate. But from here, we have to know exactly what the effects are, which we will see momentarily to really get a good understanding of what this species does. So they realize these things are all around them. Whatever is out there is waiting for them to go back to sleep. As they ride in the early morning, they then spot a fire in the distance, much like theirs was, which is really high up. They find a woman sitting there, and she says that William is marked, and they will find him supporting the idea that they are tracking his scent by night. She says the burrowers took out her family, and in this area, the burrowers come every third generation. Typically, by the time the third generation is told this story, though, they don't really believe it, but this woman tried to escape past the river where the creatures seem to stop. She begins to tell them what the burrowers actually are. They were here long before white men, before humans, 
Indians actually, where they fed on buffalo in the area. And if you know about history, we made a bit of an oopsie doopsies there uh, and took out most of the buffalo. They kind of almost went extinct. They bury their food and then let it rot and the animal cannot sleep or move. When the organs are soft and the blood is thick, they come back to eat. With the buffalo gone, the creatures had to find a new food source, which were humans. William then freaks out because they are coming after him and he needs to heal himself as well, but I don't think it would matter. So what are these creatures? They're clearly not arachnids or anything of the sort based on what we will see later. They appear to maybe be a form of proto-mammal, and while we do not see any hair on their bodies, and judging by their outward appearance, they seem to be smooth scans, like mammals would be. It's difficult to tell where they hail from, but while we do know their ability to envenomate is actually present, keeping this in mind, it would make it potentially distantly related to a creature that is already native to North America, which we will talk about them when we see them more clearly. Setting out, she's hoofing it while they're hoofing it on creatures with hooves, colloquially known as horses. William at this point starts sort of losing it as the venom from even just a cut begins to take an effect. She says his wound is spotted and it's progressing and that's how they will find him, probably because it's producing said scent. Seemingly, he would need to produce something, but what is that and what is its purpose? But well, let's discuss. The venom is very likely a protein, much like a box jellyfish, given its ability to disrupt the nervous system. What I find most odd about it, however, is its inability, potentially from an evolutionary standpoint, to stop the heart and breathing of a person. This is clearly as the animal needs them to be alive in the meantime to get the body to decompose properly, but this would mean the venom would target specific neural tissue, specifically the motor neurons and sensory neurons. The motor neurons of the body, specifically the alpha motor neurons or lower motor neurons, innervate the skeletal muscle. These neurons will release a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, in the synapse of the neuromuscular junction, which is highly important. It would seem to me that this venom targets this junction as opposed to critical areas such as diaphragm or cardiac muscle. Although it should be known that the heart has something known as the pacemaker cells, which help control the pace of the heartbeat with the aid of the brainstem, but they can still run without input from the brainstem. The venom likely blocks the receptors itself, inhibiting the ability of the acetylcholine to attach itself to the receptors. Upon doing so, this would render a person unable to move their muscle, as even though their body is sending the signal, the neurotransmitters are being disabled due to the venom presence. Now, it's not a perfect process, and it would seem that some muscle is still able to communicate, as once this venom has created a potentially like a film over the junction, it appears to stay rooted firmly in place. This may be why the enzyme is there to make it less sticky, so to speak, which then makes it immobilize the prey more quickly. Once it is in place, it may take the body days or weeks to remove this film, which would be covering most of the junctions, allowing the person to once again move. But once it is there, it doesn't appear to spread further past that point, as long as the enzymes were there after a few minutes, meaning that some connections are still functional, such as with the woman's toe and what we will see with William later. Already though, William is beginning to show signs of material moving slowly through his system, which indicates that while it can move slowly for days after the addition of the enzyme, it is faster, but solidifies in an area faster as well. A person past this point will not have their cardiac muscles disrupted as this autonomic function can continue without the input of the brain. However, the breathing I find incredibly interesting. With the neuromuscular junctions targeted, you would think that this would have an impact on the diaphragm, but it appears to just stop like just short of this, indicating it is a very precise method at what it's actually attacking. The innervation of the lungs comes from the pulmonary plexus, which is a combination of the parasympathetic and sympathetic along with the phrenic nerve. It may be that the autonomic functions are largely left alone, while just the voluntary functions are attacked. It could even be as simple as just a disruption in the brainstem, however, but I believe it to be much more than that, seeing as the eyes cannot even close. If it was just disruption of the cervical area, then the eyes and mouth should still work, but a person has full paralysis everywhere. They are functionally locked into their bodies, which means it's something more. So they decide to stop, as the woman says, they will all be taken out if they stop. As everyone tries to stay awake, Coffee begins having nightmares about Marianne. He wakes up as William asks if he's awake. William ain't looking so good. As William lays there, a creature begins approaching, but he can barely hold up his revolver. As the connection to his muscle becomes more and more blocked, fine motor control will be the first to go. Sort of like when you wake up in the middle of the night and your arm is asleep, the same thing is happening to him. But as the venom moves deeper, it affects more junctions, and eventually control of the area entirely will be lost. An attack is then launched on the camp as they keep fighting. Walnut gets shot in the leg, and the Native American woman starts yelling that they need to leave. William goes to fire a shot at Coffee, but his revolver won't fire. At this point, they lock and load and just try to get out of there. As they head back to the woods, they run into others, the Ute, 
and begin trying to help them. They realize that they're going to use William as bait for the creatures that are then actively hunting him, and Faith tells them that he's already gone because of his cut. This indicates that the Utes have seen the issue progress further, which means that if the creatures don't find him, it may be very well possible that the venom continues to move into other areas of the body, such as the cardiac muscle, resulting in the heart stopping as well. The men then throw jewelry down as Coffee finds the brooch for Marianne and realizes she's actually dead at this point. That's bar man. It's very likely the hole he found at the outpost post uh, actually contained Marianne as they do not appear to drag the prey very far. And as he was standing there, he was not very far from her, but she is most certainly gone at this point. And now he wants revenge for the men that used her as bait, or who he thinks used her as bait. Heading into the woods, he gets into some good old-fashioned hand-to-hand combat with the occasional gut shot from a revolver. Coffee hears William in the distance as he runs over to him, but hears the creatures are all around. Looking at William, he's not doing so good. Whatever they injected him with, secondarily, appears to have reached the point where he's begun breaking down his body just outside side of paralysis. He pulls Coffee's revolver to stop the other guy from attacking, hitting him in the stomach, as Coffee then backs up into a bear trap, probably breaking his leg. Or it usually would break his leg. While stuck, the creatures begin approaching William from all sides as they start to dig in on him. <laughs> they now approach Coffee as he almost put his hand in another bear trap and then uses it on the cricket's face. He then gets his leg free as one of the other crickets approaches the Native American. Coffee goes caveman on it with a sharpened stick and poisons it. The fish and William were poisoned purposely to take these creatures out or at least immobilize them. He goes around attempting to finish off all the rest of them as they begin coming up. He's able to drive them off using their own venom against them before stabbing the last one with a spear, immobilizing it. And that's what happens when you sleep for three generations. You don't realize there's homo sapiens up on the surface building stats to slap your species back down to the dirt. USA! Coffee, after fighting all the creatures off, steals William's arm. I guess. He won't need it anymore. Literally a farewell to arms. The sun begins coming up as the creatures begin burning when exposed to the sunlight, which is fairly strange. Their skins begin falling off, which, well that sucks. And they all meet their end, exposed to their own venom. So with that, what are these creatures and what are they potentially related to? If we take into consideration that these creatures appear to be potentially a mammal of sorts that lives under the ground, but their backwards legs are pretty strange, they would have a venomous claw of sorts that paralyzes prey, I would believe that these creatures are distantly related to either shrews or potentially likely moles given their behavior. Shrews and moles are unlike many other mammals as they have both toxic saliva when they bite, it gets into an animal, but some shrews also possess a venom claw where they can stab prey and it results and their paralysis as well. Now typically they eat earthworms and grubs, but have been noted to hunt on land for certain insects. They have a tremendous sense of smell, but are typically pretty small, and they are also native to North America. We see in this instance the shrew categorization works, however the moles are also known to bite prey and then place it in the dirt somewhere so that they can come back and eat. In nature though, it's not too difficult to find instances where similar traits can arise within a species despite not being related, but in this instance, since we know shrews and moles are actually related, this appears to be an offshoot of these species, a completely separate branch resulting in this new species, though I mean I guess new to us. Likely some time ago, there were like a larger variant of shrew or mole who began hunting smaller mammals on the surface. At some point, their own evolutionary advantages may have been pushed during the glacial period that resulted in creatures like the short-faced bear that was around 11.5 feet tall and actually had a vertical reach of 14.1 feet or 3.4 meters in height with a reach of 4.3 meters that these things existed because of the ice age. Comparatively, we all know the standard also. That means this creature had roughly 4.6 bald eagles in height. It could almost reach out as far as a 1966 289 V8 Mustang was long. This thing was a nightmare, but no more nightmarish, actually arguably way less nightmarish, than an anglerfish, which is a wretched abomination, with the largest one ever been found to be 6 feet long, weighing 126 pounds. What a detestable creature. Anyhow, it was likely this species arose during the time competing with larger animals, which in turn would alter its own physiology to not only bring down large prey, like a mammoth that roamed North America around this time, but also allowed them to retain body heat in the cold soils during the Ice Age. This resulted in creatures growing in size with the added benefit of roughly a 100 year period of hibernation. This means that after they had their fill and went into the dirt to hibernate, on the surface things would change rapidly, but they were not exposed to it, thus they were protected from extinction. Emerging, they would eat and then go back down for another 100 years. Doing this 10 times would result in the passage of roughly 1,000 years. You can kind of see with this method that after the creatures ate their fill, their metabolisms would plummet afterwards, leading to very little happening in the way of aging or adapting to the environment in general. And this may also be why their venom was so effective because it was adapted to a time period where the prey was much larger, meaning it would need to be used on a creature several orders of magnitude larger than Homo sapiens. 
When the creature went into hibernation, there were plenty of buffalo, but upon emerging, there was only man, and because of this, their adaptations that were used on a several hundred pound animal were now being used on a much more scrawny prey by comparison. This hibernation was not all good, however. It's clear that these things spend most of their time under the ground, and because of that, exposure to sunlight is very limited. In fact, all light is extremely limited. Fires seem to be enough to keep these creatures away, as the light may in fact hurt their skin, as they chose to stay just beyond campfire light. Because of this weakness, when the sun rises on those that were stuck outside, this causes the sun to be able to penetrate quite deeply into the dermal layer. It would seem to me that it was able to get down to the hypodermis of these creatures, which is quickly destroyed by the sun, much like in a third degree burn. The sun's radiation would likely kill the cells, causing their connection to the underlying fibrous tissue to let go, which in turn allows for their skin to slough away from the body, much like in a third degree burn, as mentioned, making these creatures highly susceptible to the sun's radiation, which would then, I mean, you know, you try walking around with just your muscle exposed, you're probably going to dehydrate pretty quickly and just in general, meet your end. So as Coffee, Walnut, and Fate, and the other guys from the woods all meet and get out, Coffee says he will go and get help. It'll take two days, but he will be right back as fast as he can. As he crosses the horror that is known as South Dakota, he eventually finds his hat, of all things, and near it, a person was buried. Eventually he finds a caravan moving through as he catches a ride with them as they head back towards the others. Well, it's pretty horrific what he finds when he returns. Faith and the other man were strung up after Henry had gotten to them first. As Coffee and Henry talk, he says basically he did it because he found William in the state that he was and assumed it was a result of these two. Coffee asks about Walnut as Henry says, Oh, he's also dead. We tried to amputate his leg and he didn't survive the surgery. He says that he was pretty hysterical trying to tell them what happened, but Henry just didn't listen. Henry remarks the stewards, the people who they were set out to find, were probably done by the time they even started. But he could take this chance to make sure the Native Americans don't do anything like this again. Basically, one giant excuse to continue his campaign. As we get the credits running, it ends on like a mega down note as everyone who was buried gets eaten. Dobby is uncovered as the creatures dig in and he breathes his last breath. So that one woman lost her suitor and her son and then her previously mentioned husband. Man, that's some brutal stuff. Ultimately, these creatures appear to hail from a time of larger prey and as such, had their venom attenuated to that time period. For a while, the buffalo would be hunted before being taken out, leaving just humans to fill the role as prey. Now, they say these things cannot be killed by man, which I completely disagree. These are animals, and as such, they are more than capable of having their biochemical reactions disrupted to the point of expiration. Ultimately, what you would need to find is where are their organs located, are, is like their brain worth going after, and do they bleed? Because you can find those things, you can 100% without a doubt take these things out. And that's why man is top dog, because we may not know how to take you out in the beginning, but something somewhere makes you tick. And if that can be destroyed, then that spells the end of that creature. But anyhow, I want to hear what you guys think. These things are clearly able to be got by man's hand. I don't really know what they're talking about. Like, oh, you can't take them out. Like, yes, you can. Let me know down in the comments. If you enjoy, then please leave a like as this gets the video out there. And subscribing is a great way to stay up to date on what I post. I'll drop my merch, Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and channel link to Roanoke Tales. Where last week, or really this week, we're talking about the Wolf Siege of Paris. I was supposed to do that last week, but I got totally sidetracked. But anyhow, speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astrophysicist, Death Dancer. Thank you, bro. Next up, our scientist, Chad, the enjoyer of scientific explanations via great horror movies, Dakota23, Florian Lacune, Lucian Dragon, Octavia Serpentia, and the last final girl on the left. Thank you guys as well. And the rest of my patrons, I appreciate you. Your help goes a long way towards keeping this channel running and thank you. All right, so that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed. Have a good Thanksgiving and I'll see y'all in the next one.